Um, yeah, very excited to be here talking with real humans. Um, that is my international flight since COVID. Um, yeah, um, this is Brian I'm coming from New Zealand. It's uh, yeah, 24 flights, so I'm sure no one can beat me. Um, yeah, but it's very, again very exciting to actually speak with human during a physical conference. Uh, that's something I'm really uh, missing since the COVID days. Yeah, I'm the co-founder of Akala, as well as I'm also uh, one of the co contributors of Substrate and Polkadot. Uh, some of you guys may know me as XLC. Um, I've encountered those issues on Substrate, and maybe I should can finally complain those problems with you face to face. And yeah, um, jokes aside. Um, today, I'm going to talk a bit more about how the future of dev development, like how we compare Web2 applications compared to Web3 applications, and maybe we can draw some inspirations from this. Um, well, we all know history always repeats itself. Um, so sometimes if you want to um, find, predict the future, see, I don't know, see if the price is going up or down, if things are going in circles, you will look at historical data. And similarly applies for uh, evaluations of the application development. Now we can, um, while well, looking at the past, see how the Web2 application involves and try to get some understandings of how they might be involved, how they applies to the Web3 applications. Um, so let's start with the infrastructure side. Um, so that is basically where the applications are running on. So for simple Web2 applications, that just means, well, servers on the internet or just computers, that where the applications are running on. And then for Web3 applications, then we have blockchains and smart contract platforms, that I think that you, um, smart contracts or um, runtime application, et cetera, running on. Um, so it all begins with this great innovation called computer. Well, I guess you all know it. Um, so initially, we just well, have computer. You have applications, that are something like Excel, for example. You can, they are super useful. You can do a lot of things with that. Um, but well, with things on local computer, that is very limited. And then like, on the pre-blockchain era, we have a bunch of cryptographic uh, tools. Um, you can do authentication, authorization, signing, encryption. They are super useful. They can achieve a lot of things. Simply cannot be done without those tools, but still is somewhat limited. There are a lot of things um, cannot be done with them. And then on the web two, we have um, well more connections. We have computers. They can connect to each others. We have intranet and, and internet. And we can do a lot more interesting things. We can share things around the internet. We can, like, for example, hosting a blog with Web2 servers. They are a lot more interesting, but um, I don't know if, how many you have actually host your own servers. It's, well, I guess it's easy to have it up and running, but it's definitely not easy if you want to make sure it's secure, uptime, scale, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there's a lot of work required. It's not that flexible. And it's, again, can be expensive to build and operate and scale up. Um, so looking at Web3 sites, we have um, purpose-built blockchains, type blockchain built for us only single purpose. They just like Bitcoin, it's designed for transactions, payments. Um, that is, a, if you need something else, well, you need to build yourself. You, if you say, I don't know, you want to build a domain and register Web3 applications, you need to build yourself, you need to you might be able to fork Bitcoin, uh, taking some public component for it, like P2P, for example. And you still need to build a risk. It, it's costly, it's very hard. People, a lot of people tried. Some get successful, some are not. And then, well, not everyone would like to operate their own server. Similarly, not everyone wants to, I don't know if anyone wants to operate their own blockchain. Um, but, this one reason why web clouds, but they basically, well, someone else's computer, they manage the things for me. Like I can finally write my applications and then have a bunch of configurations, uh, or also a credit card, and then I have, can have my um, application deployed on AWS in no time. Um, it's pretty easy to build and deploy. Um, they're super good and nice, and the cloud uh, service provider, they just take care of a lot of work, so the developers, they don't need to worry about it. So similarly applies to the Web3 applications that um, we have smart contract platforms such as Ethereum. 
that people or developers uh, or individual people, they can using Solidity to write codes. And then, well, you don't need your credit card. You still need to have a bunch of ease to pay the gas, but you can have them deployed in no time. That's super nice. You don't need to worry about transactions, formats, account formats, uh, P2P protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So that's very good. Uh, this is where most of the um, dev applications they are right now. And then, uh, if you're using any modern applications, um, they are mostly just, they are probably not purposely built to be multi-cloud, but they are. Like, a lot of people are saying building DeFi protocol is like building legal pieces. Some protocol are just pieces, and some protocol assemble them in some interesting shapes, and then you have product. But we're already doing this for years on um, mo any modern sets of applications. Like, a lot of applications, they need features logging, user support. Like we'll, then we can use in Google Login, for example. We can use, um, I don't know, Intercom, Zendex, or something, service to take care of some individual parts of the user application flow. You don't actually need to build everything yourself. So that's good that you can focus on the business projects. You don't need to um, think about those. They can be delegated to other service providers. So um, people can build the applications much faster and much safer. And then, does if say you're using Google Login, um, it will be dependent on obviously the parts will be running on GCP. Your own application might be running on AWS, and then some other servers might be I don't know running on Zura. But then those devs, they, those applications, they are basically multi-cloud applications. Like, but like. Um, on the user's point of view, they don't care. They, they don't need to know. They, as long as like, those things are done, obviously, if AWS goes down, they will notice. But otherwise, assuming they are all secure and uptime is fine, then users are not going to know if there is a multi channel application, or sorry, multi cloud applications. Um, yes, so the underlying infrastructure should be transparent to the users. So, similarly, well, on the, on the other side, blockchain side, we start getting some network of blockchains. There are a bunch of different blockchains connect through bridges, and then we have the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, finally, the real connect blockchains with our bridges by using the shared security and XM. Uh, very excited for the actually to be actually go live in the next few weeks. But anyway, um, we can have this kind of things that um, applications they can depending on other servers. So this is a uh, um, just an example of applications. We don't really have this thing yet. Well, feel free, we'll help take this idea and build it, please. <laughs> so say we have a lending applications in the middle. It can using assets, AUSD, L dot, liquid staking dot for Akala. It can using dot from Polkadot. Uh, they can be using like USDT, for example, from state mine. Uh, they are all just assets that the application shouldn't, that the use of the application. As you see, I have, I don't know, 50 USDT, 50 dots, 50 AUSD, setting on different blockchain, but there's the money, like why do they need to know which blockchain the money is setting on? So users will see the balance, I guess, and then underlying the lending app, it could be deployed on Akala or some other EVM platforms, so all the EVM platforms like this. Like you can, in modern applications, they, a lot, you can have them deploy in different clouds, or all, all the clouds if you want to. Like, this should similar can happen on uh, decentralized applications. It can be deployed on different EVNs. And then, because we can communicate with each other, there's a lot of things that can be done. By, uh, if, as a lending app, you probably need to allocate the tokens or the liquidities across different instances of the deployment based on the needs or requirements to rebalance them. Well, that's fine. There, there are a lot of easy ways to do that with XCM. Things can happen trustlessly without any uh, troubles. And then, well, then most of the decentralized protocols or DAO, they would probably have governance features. Then, then uh, most of them would need uh, some identity providers. So people, when voting, say, a proposal, you actually know who proposed this proposal, which is quite important. And then, well, we can potentially using identity service provider like Geld, uh, Geld. Um, so as the application developer, I, well, we'll be able to assess all these things, uh, deploy here, but I don't need to worry a lot about 
the things. I don't need to build my own identity solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, why should anyone want to? Um, people shouldn't need to do that. And then this application can be, should be natively or built inherently among the chains, so to provide a real true user experience to the users. Um, so this is something I really would love to see to have it happened in, well, this could be one of the hackathon thing. Um, now look at on the other side. So infrastructure is where the application runs on, and then how the de development paradise is how we build applications. So again, uh, I was the iOS developer, so I was just using that as an example. Uh, initially, um, to build the iOS app, you need to use an object of C, which is squared language. Um, but still, uh, well, you kind of need to do all the work yourself. And then if you do happen to need Android applications, you can't really use the um, iOS code there. You just, most of the time, you need to review most of them from scratch, which is a lot of work. Um, yeah, on the Bitcoin as well, um, is, well, again, single purpose build from ground up uh, using CFFS. There's a lot of work. Um, yeah, it's just not easy to build a native application. Well, that was the old times, but now we own, like, if you're a mobile developer, you know, there's a lot of library frameworks to make things easier. And now we have Substrate, so actually building another Bitcoin is quite easy. Um, so this is kind of a solved problem, which is great, but let's continue. Um, and then we have, um, to solve this cross-chain platform issues, um, people have created a thing called hybrid app. Um, so it's using a framework like, for example, Ionic. So basically we package, um, the application itself we written using HTML and JavaScript. And then the pack application will be packaged in some binaries run, uh, can be deployed on iOS or Android. The application logic is shared using the same code. That's great, but you don't need to actually write things in twice because why would anyone want to do that? And you can come with easy multi-platform support, but everything else is a trade-offs. There are some, um, there are some um, considerations about using this approach. The first is that the performance is not that good. It's, it was very easy to tell if the app is built with Ionic because, well, you can feel the scoring is not smooth animation, it's laggy. So it, it's not the best user experience you can provide. But while well, it's fast and it saves time. And, but if you're building anything more advanced, you want to leverage all the features of the hardware, I don't know, using GPS, using camera, you need to fall back to using the native APIs, which is coming down uh, using our app. But now, talking on the other side, the OP3, um, we are now most of the people using Ethereum, Solidity, EVM to build applications. We have the Solidity codes, run, compile, deploy. Uh, it runs on Ethereum. Just a matter of some configuration changes, the same thing deployed on the new EVM blockchain, which is great. But again, same issue as Pies. Um, there's inherently going to be some limitation on the performance of EVM. EVM itself is also not really designed to be the most performant a performance uh, VNs that a lot of decisions is just not designed for speed. And then if you need to use some of features that is not exposed uh, to you by the Ethereum EVN sandbox, well, it's tough that you can't really build your native plugins. You can propose EIP, try to get them implemented. I, did, I never tried myself. I don't know if any of you have tried it but I'm not going to depend my next moon landing projects on that. Um, so that is uh, very limits what can be achieved with using this approach. And then a, lo a lot of apps now, they are building things like React Native, uh, which is, um, the basic the idea of React Native is that you learn once, uh, you can write multiple, all the places, uh, you learn React uh, kind of concept. You don't necessarily um, porting the existing code directly to other platforms, but the concept is that you can easily rewrite them. And so using this kind of approach, um, we can still build applications using the higher level language, such as JavaScript, TypeScript, which is much easier for most of the developers to use. But um, we can easily fall back to using uh, native code 
for any resource intensive work, like such as that handling animation, for example. Uh, this is one of the good thing about it can, it can be done very efficiently. Um, so it's sharing most of the benefits of the hybrid apps, but it can be much, much faster. And it's also designed in such a way it's easier to assess the native features. And on the Web3 side, um, we don't, I don't think we have real the hybrid, this kind of thing running, I guess. When, um, so it's totally possible with now with Substrate and EV and things, we should be able to do something similar. We should be able to have the applications running using Solidity again or some other uh, higher level language, um, not Rust, um, because well, Rust is great, but I know it's definitely not the most use of uh, beginner friendly language. So people can should be able to write language use Solidity, have them deployed if they need some native features. Um, actually, having the blockchain supports them. Blockchain actually provides APIs for them designed to be integrated with Rust. Sorry, with the Solidity language. So you can have the applications to be both on the runtime, sorry, on the smart contract side and the runtime side, working together. Then you can have some of the compute intensive tasks building using in substrate parlors. You can have some of the things, I don't know, like governance, things that parameter changes, things that, or if you, I don't know, building some strategies that changes uh, every once in a while, uh, that can be happened in the smart contract side. So you're really getting the benefits of both sides by using this kind of approach. So um, that is not a hypothetical application. That is actually something uh, running inside Akala. So uh, while well it's actually running right now on your Kurura, uh, but will be live on Akala. Um, so this Tapio protocol uh, is a stable SOAP protocol. Um, so it's, it have built a stable SOAP palette that's embedded inside Akara runtime that handles the calculations, the actual swap, the, a lot of things, it's just much easier to write using Rust compared to Solidity, doing all the math, basically. And then um, the EVN side is able to assess this palette through uh, some special precompiles so with offers. So they can, the countries can call in into the palettes directly, and the palettes can also calling into the contrast directly through some APIs. And in the workshop I'm going to give on Saturday, I'm going to explain that. Um, and then the, S, the palace is able to assess the native SS, AUSD, for example, as well as the uh, EVN ERC20 SS that will be, say, um, USDC bridged to Akala through so Longhole Bridge. There will be a wrapped ERC20 tokens. Um, so this comes with a unified interface so that palace can work with both of them without worrying about the low level detail. If it's a native token, it's a substrate token, if it's the added 20 token, it doesn't matter. The palace can simply assess them without any problem. And then the contrast is also able to, only from EVN side, this is another ERC20, so obviously that works. And all the native tokens, they are also exposed to the EVN as ERC20 tokens. So to use the native assets from Akala, it's just another ERC20, it just works. So with this new architecture, there's come a lot of benefits. That the runtime obviously is much more performant. Um, the stable asset palette is built by the Tapio team, maintained by them. So if they, well obviously they still probably want to work with us to make sure it secure safe, doesn't come with some loopholes causing some troubles. But again, they, it's up to them to design the interface, what sort of feature they want to expose to the smart country side. They are the guys building both the application on the runtime side and the smart country side. They are like the guys designing APIs. So they don't really need to go with a long EIP process. Hey, I would like to make sure the precompiles look exactly like that. They just do it themselves. And of course, after the code is secure and safe and reviewed by us, it can be merged around half later. And then on the EVN side, well, it's just smart contracts. So all the same, say, upgrade proxy patterns applies if they want to do a governance there, however governance process they want, they can implement it, and whatever um, process passed, they can have the governance country upgraded, uh, parameter adjusted, things changes, so that they can handle all these things like without, say, if they want to adjust some, I don't know, the fees or something, they don't need to go to Akala governance process, uh, which is that why should the application upgrades need to go with the blockchain layer one of governance process. So with this approach, 
uh, we can have a quite clear separation on this. So yes, I believe this will be one of the ways that we could build up. No, of course, not all applications should be built with this way, but different provider very interesting possibilities on how we can build those things. And of course, there are always challenges. I look at how much GitHub issues I've raised. Uh, there's always a lot of things we need to do. Um, so first thing is about more multi-chain applications. If everything run in a single server, you can just call the process, call this function, and just do some blocking and return, like, just like on Ethereum, start like interacting between different smart countries, super easy and nice, and everyone's happy with that. Except it doesn't scale. Um, if we only want to scale it, do things on multiple blockchains, the communication and message passing, they are not synchronized, they are asynchronized. So that creates a lot of challenges, which we already faced them before, and they are already solved. We just need to do the thing again. That if you want to build a Node.js server, calling another server, you will all know if you um, build it, all the, uh, if there was that a lot of risk condition can happen if you're not trying to manage the state properly. Uh, this was Cobalt Health, that if you don't write JS ES5, you'll know how bad that was. Um, there are, of course, the int can introduce a lot of unexpected dependencies on how s the orders of things that could change, your depending thing on the server return thing faster than that, then suddenly this have some lag and thing doesn't work. So it can be very challenging, but again, we already have solved all these problems. Like we, there's no reason we cannot solve it again. But of course, there's a lot of pain which happened, but I don't know how, how many years it took JS involving from COVID health to actually to asynchronize ES6 and find solve. So similar thing is going to, needs to be happened. And then for the UX side, that is, if you only deal with EVM chains, I guess you probably find only with Metamask. Still, that is a hassle. You need to remember switch your networks and doing things if otherwise unexpected things could happen. And the assets and protocols are everywhere. Like, and again, that is something that users shouldn't need to know. Like, why they need to know which assets and my tokens are, and users should be choosing the applications, not choosing the blockchains. Now, no one uses your application because it's deployed on Azure or, or because it's deployed on AWS. Now, they use application because it's great application, not where the application are deployed on. Of course, it also depending, the assumption is that all these uh, low-level platforms that are similarly secure and safe, well, which is not the case in other side, but at least on the Polkadot side, we have shared security, so I guess that's all the same. Um, yeah, then there's always, well, again, we're making trade-offs, there's always, you can make things secure, they will be slow, you can make things very flexible, and then they'll be insecure. There's they just a lot of decisions, or building, writing software, building software, is basically making decisions all the time. So we are, well, good at that, and we have done that before. There's no reason we cannot do this again. It's just a lot of hard work is still required. So we're still very early stage. So that's one reason why we, uh, and all the project teams, all the teams here, they have bounties, uh, listing all the challenges we have, uh, hoping you guys can help us to fix them. Um, yeah, so right now, most of the applications, they are focusing, or most of the protocols are packaging, they're focusing on single blockchains. Um, like, like on previously, that's fine. We know everyone either use Ethereum or use BSC. They don't really using them at the same time, I guess. But now with the Polkadot ecosystem, we are inherently a multi blockchain thing. So yeah, the protocol really should be depending, designed to be works with multi blockchain to leverage the benefits. I guess you can still choose to not do so. It just you will be building another existing Ethereum app, which is totally fine, but will be less interesting, I guess. Um, yeah, again, you can make your applications hybrid um, to taking the benefits of both sides. You can, the flexibility of the smart contracts and the performance and all the unique features like, I don't know, op option workers, prioritized transitions, operational transitions, they are just simply impossible with Solidity. 
now can be possible using this hybrid app approach, you can take in full leverage of the substrate features without actually coding all of everything inside substrate. And again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but the UI should be focusing on the assets, that people should know what, what are the assets. They shouldn't, uh, why should they care about the infrastructure? And we, again, we have done this before. We should, I think we all should take a look back at how this has happened on the Web2 application development. See if we can draw any explorations from there. That there are a lot of good lessons we've learned there that can be applied here. Of course, we still probably need to re reinvent some of whales. That's perfectly fine. We just need to, well, make sure we're not making the same mistakes again. And again, we still need to do a lot of investment and improve the infrastructure side. That's again with one of the we have all these bounties and um, Polkadot Treasury is also uh, helping a lot on this area. Um, so now you know how maybe you can s some good ideas. Um, there are a lot of ways to build with Akala. So uh, again, we're going to launch our EVM Plus very soon. And you can deploy your Solidity Smart Country projects there. Or you can deploy your pilots. Or you can deploy elsewhere. But still, because we are connected application, we are connected blockchains, it was, you can still be part of Akala ecosystem without uh, actually be deployed on Akala because we can still communicate, work together on solving some problems. Or you can just choose all three that works fine. So yes, yeah, it's, it's up to you. Think about it, see if you can find any edges or alphas, I guess, if you can go with some approach, doing something interesting that was simply not possible before. Um, a lot of people ask me when EVN. <laughs> so um, I would like to say, well, it's going to uh, make, we're going to uh, do a phase to release. And the first phase starts next week. It will be this week if I'm not here. Um, but probably I don't really want to get things out of the door while I'm staying on stage and then my phone ran up where I want to fire. <laughs> so you'll be happy on next week. Um, so it's, it will be a phase approach. It starts with the one hole bridge. So one whole bridge will be deployed as smart contracts, solidity smart contracts. And then it will be deployed on the crew rafters. Um, and then the second phase, we have to go with a phase approach because um, we don't really want to everyone start deploying the asset. And we are not 100% Ethereum compatible. There will be some troubles. There will be some technical difficulties. We are, we are still a smallish team. We cannot handle all the support requests at the same time. So we're going to do a phase approach, letting some people in first while we're taking the feedbacks, improving our documentations, work with them, and then letting more people in. So there's then first thing, one whole bridge. Second thing, there will be a lot more um, apply or devs already working with us for a long time. And then after things are fully, we're fairly comfortable, everything are running, all the software are tested, nothing goes wrong then we will be open to everyone. So again, so everything will be happen on Krura first and for Akala followed by that. So it, it's usually, every phase is usually two to three weeks after the Krura release. So that the whole reason of Krura is they will try things there. If it's good, we deploy it on Akala. So, um, it, Yeah, so it will be like the first next way, and then after three weeks will be the private is not like go through this way. It's more going parallel. Um, yeah, so really looking forward to see you guys, some of you guys having your application deployed on Kura and Kala. So yeah, let's build together. Thanks.